Okay, it, it's Mac, M A C K, and the last name is Tyner, T Y N E R. And I'm from Gainesville, been here pretty much all my life. I'm, I'm going to be 60 years old this year. So. We're just going to talk about like the Ofawa, Ofawa okay. River, that sort of thing. Okay. Do you have um, anything in mind? To talk well, about? when I was five or six, um, my parents took me to the Ofawa. Okay. And um, my dad taught chemical engineering at the university. And one of the uh, shop guys that made projects for the professors lived near there and he would conduct boat tours on the river. So he took us down there and took us fishing one day. Okay. A little bitty, little bitty boat with a three horsepower Evinrude motor and we caught some little bitty fish and lined them up. I said, this is the daddy fish, this is the mama fish, and this is a little bitty baby fish. <laughs> they, they made some home movies, which we still have of that. Wow. Of course, this is before the dam, way before the dam or the big bridge to nowhere that goes over the little bitty creek. We always wondered when they built that bridge, what was going to happen there that was so exciting. And then we found out, oh, they're planning a barge canal under here. It must be 120 feet off the ground. You, you go over that bridge, you, you feel like you've done something. <laughs> Are we, OK. Um, were, did you guys like originally support the idea of the canal? Nobody asked us. Nobody asked the common people. It was a, a project which was envisioned by the Army Corps of Engineers, I think. Um, from what I've read, it started back around the turn of the century, at the time they were building the Panama Canal. They thought, hey, you know, shipping is so much more efficient to, to move freight around. They thought, you know, instead of having to go around the Florida Keys and Miami, you just cut right through the state of Florida. It would save money and time. And, but they forgot about the environmental consequences of that when they planned it. So there you have it. It's a big lake. I've been fishing there a few times. I was going to say, yeah. what changes have you seen since uh -huh. being in here? Like, if you can think of something, you're always just like, wow, it used to be like that. Do you have a reoccurring sort of? And I know you're laughing. Yeah. <laughs> <Is there> one? <laughs> well, of course, the bridge was 100 feet higher than it was. Uh -huh. um, the, the place over at Rodman where the dam is, nobody visited that before because there wasn't really much access to it. Uh -huh. And, you know, it made it possible to put a big boat in there. I still don't understand what they do with the locks and why they are able to crush manatees in the locks. So what are they opening them for anyway? Is that somebody paddles through with a canoe and they open the lock? <laughs> I, don't, I never did quite figure why they didn't just lock them down and leave them. And it's kind of odd to me. I also heard that the river's been like different colors depending on what decade it was. Like it was so polluted at some points from stuff in Jacksonville that it would actually change colors. Well, the St. Johns River does change colors with the level. As the uh, if the water rises and goes way back in the swamp near the cypress trees, you get some more dark color from the tannic acid. Okay. And certain times in the spring, it'll it'll clear up because there's not quite as much of the organic matter from the trees. Now my wife grew up, you should interview her, she grew up on the St. John's uh -huh. in Jacksonville and when she was a girl they water skied in the, in the river. Yeah. It was that clean. But slowly with industrialization and more plants and it got dirtier to where they didn't, they didn't like to water ski in it anymore. They used to shrimp in the backyard and fish right there. So. And of course there's still shrimp in the river. We, we go to Placa sometimes and shrimp and August is the month for shrimping. They always look bigger than they really are when you catch them. <laughs> but it's kind of fun to do, you know, throw the net and, and pull it up until your back begins to hurt. Yeah, I do it on the beach sometimes. Do you? Uh-huh. These are not quite as big. They claim each river has its own species of shrimp. And the St. John's River shrimp are a little smaller than what you're used to seeing in the Atlantic. Yeah. I've never actually seen St. John's River shrimp. No, you haven't? Well, in August, go down to the pier downtown and you will see a lot of people at night with lanterns throwing fish balls in the water. They make a, a mixture of clay and fish powder that attracts them with lights and then they'll throw the nets over the bait and pull them up. Now, during the daytime, if you get in about 30 feet of water near the shore, there are certain spots where the shrimp will you know, accumulate to eat and you can, you can catch them there. A good pull, you'll pull up 50 or 60 shrimp, which makes it worthwhile. 
course, they're hard to find. It's a big river. And my wife always says, well, where, where are these shrimp? How are we going to find the shrimp? I said, well, go where the boats are. They're attracted to boats. Hmm. Really, it's the other way around, of course. You know, the people, mm -hmm. people have looked and looked, and when they start finding them, they stay. Yeah. So you just get over near the boats. That's where the shrimp will be. Then you went to high school with Sam Proctor and Gaines. Well, no, I went with his son, Mark. His son. Yeah. Right. Yeah, Sam was his dad, and, you know, I, I had met him a few times. But, of course, I'm very interested in oral history. I think passing the stories down is important. My grandmother grew up near Crestview, a little town there named Laurel Hill, and uh, she and her husband homesteaded 40 acres in 1905. And as she says, the government would bet you 40 acres that you couldn't live there five years without starving to death. And of course, that was the rule. You had to prove that you had lived on the land for five years and if you had enough witnesses to testify, then they would give you a deed to it, 40 acres. Uh, my great-grandfather actually was able to homestead 160 acres near there. So that four times the commitment, 20 years? Well, earlier on, they had more land to get rid of, so they gave out 160 acres, which is a lot of land if you think about it. Yeah, that's a lot. Yeah. But he, hom he homesteaded 160 acres. I, I still have the deed. It's about this big. And it's signed by Grover Cleveland, signed by the president. Wow. <laughs> That's pretty impressive. His old house is still there, hand built house. It's built in 1888, because my grandmother was three, she told me, when, when they moved there. Yeah. But they were farmers. You know, he, he brought peaches to the area, he had Alberta peaches. One of his best stories was one day he noticed his peaches were disappearing. And he walked by the sawmill, there were a lot of peach pits on the ground and peels, and he asked, where'd you get the peaches? And the, the men working there said, oh, Mr. Seeger sold them to us. He's got lots more. So then he knew where they were going. So late one night, he went down there with his gun and wa waited for the man to cross the, cross the fence. And when, as my grandmother would say, when he crossed the fence, then he cut down on him. And then next morning, he took his son, Bob, with him and the shovel, went out there to bury him. This was the wild and woolly west of Florida. <laughs> they got out there and all they found was the bag of peaches. So we never knew whether the guy was wounded or, or they missed or what, but there was no sign of him. He never lost another wow. peach. <laughs> so that's, that's one of the interesting stories from West Florida.